If we haven't met before, I'm Glenn. I'm uh, Emma's husband. Uh, she is handsome. She is pretty. She's the girl from Belfast City. And uh, we met in England. And uh, we're married, and we now live in Eastbourne, which uh, Emma considers to be halfway between Ireland and Australia, which tells you everything you need to know about compromise in our marriage, but that's another story. Um, we have uh, Ruby, uh, who's four years old, and we have JJ, who's just come into our family just 10 days ago, 18 months old, uh, we adopted him. And uh, so I've brought Ruby with me to give Emma some bonding time with JJ, and uh, it was a beautiful moment this morning, we were flying in, Ruby and, and myself, as we uh, came down from 36,000 feet to land at Belfast International Airport, and uh, we live on the Sunshine Coast in Eastbourne, the Sunshine Coast, um, which my Australian family thinks is really hilarious, because we have a Sunshine Coast in Australia, it's, it's located about one kilometre from the centre of the sun, you can hear your skin audibly crackling there, but... My, my family calls uh, Eastbourne the Unshine Coast, actually, that's, which is pretty cruel. But, uh, but anyway, Ruby is used to a, a little bit more sunshine uh, than this. And, and uh, so we, we descended from 36,000 feet into the clouds in order to, to land at Belfast International. And as we go through the clouds, Ruby says, when are we coming out of the clouds again? And I said, on Thursday, Ruby, on Thursday. <laughs> um, that's, that's, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> A friend of mine said, it's the glory cloud. That's what you have here. You've got the, the glory cloud here. Um, we're going to be uh, spending some time in John 17, spending some time thinking about the happy God, the God who is joy, the God who is enjoyable and wants us to enjoy him. Uh, so if you have a Bible, why don't you turn to uh, John chapter 17. I'm just going to read... Uh, from verse 20 in John chapter 17, you, you might know the context of this. Jesus is praying in front of his disciples. So there are his disciples, there is Jesus, and he's praying to his Father, and he's praying for us. That's amazing, isn't it? That's why it's often called the high priestly prayer. Here is Jesus kind of representing us before the Father. You know how Aaron, the great high priest in the Old Testament, he would go into the Holy of Holies, and he would have done the atoning work out in the, uh, the, the, the place of, the, of exile, the place outside the holy place. There he would uh, make the sacrifices at the altar. He'd bring the blood into God's presence. He'd sprinkle the blood on the altar. And one thing that he was wearing was a, a breast piece with 12 stones on his chest. And what were the 12 stones? They were representing the 12 tribes of Israel. He did all that he did in atonement. He did all that he did in ascending into the presence of God. He did it for us, carrying us on his heart. And then he spreads the incense around the most holy place. Here we have a high priestly prayer. Jesus is praying for us before the Father. John 17, verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone, not just for the 12 disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them, that all of us, may be one, Father. Just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you've given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Amen. <laughs> what an incredible prayer. And you know, that's all prayer is. Prayer is just saying amen to the the perfect intercession of Christ. You, you hear what Jesus prays for us and you just say, Amen, Amen, Amen. What wonderful words to hear that Jesus has brought us in on a Niagara Falls of love and glory and joy. That's what John 17 is all about. Jesus has been in on a Niagara Falls, an eternal Niagara Falls of love 
and glory and joy. And Jesus says in verse 24, if you heard it, Jesus says, I want them to be with me where I am. Where is Jesus? Jesus is enjoying the living God, and he invites the world in on this eternal love, this eternal glory, this eternal joy. Uh, as an evangelist, I go around the place and I, I speak to people uh, about Jesus, and uh, I've got a couple of rules of thumb uh, when I'm speaking to different demographics. Uh, if I'm speaking to people over 65, and uh, I live in Eastbourne, so that's... Uh, <laughs> If you don't know Eastbourne, it, it's, it's the sort of place where all the shop windows are bifocal. It's, it's that kind of, you know, it's mobility scooter shops everywhere, right? It's, it's, it's that kind of place. But if, I, if I'm beyond the four walls of a church and I'm speaking to someone who's over 65 and they tell me that they're a Christian, I don't believe them. Um, I, I'm not rude about it. I don't sort of poke them in, a ch in, in, in their chest and say, prove it, you know. Sing, shine, Jesus, shine. Go on, you know, show that you're a true Christian. It's just that internally, I'm just thinking, oh, yeah, they might be a Christian. They might be. But also, it might just be a nominal Christianity, mightn't it? Because 65 years ago, it was relatively straightforward if you lived in the UK. It was relatively straightforward to go to a shelf full of labels and to pick out the one that said Christian and to put it on your chest and go out into the world and you say, I'm a Christian. Why are you a Christian? Well, I'm English. So of course, I'm a Christian. And it was just a, it's just a label that could help you to navigate the world in a frictionless manner, right? There is such a thing as nominal Christianity. We understand that, don't we? So one rule of thumb is, if I'm, if I'm beyond the four walls of a church, and I'm talking to I go to Anglic an Anglican church, so even when I'm within the four walls of a church, um, if I encounter somebody and they say they're a Christian, I don't necessarily believe them. I'm thinking, maybe, let's talk about Jesus, and let's see where you really stand. So that's one rule of thumb. Over 65, they say they're a Christian, I don't believe them. Another rule of thumb, if somebody is under 35, and they tell me they're an atheist, I don't believe them, and for exactly the same reason. Because there's such a thing as nominal atheism, right? It is incredibly easy these days to go to a shelf full of labels and to pick out the atheist label and to whack it on your chest and out you go into the world. And you say, what do you believe? Oh, I'm an atheist. Have you done more than five minutes of metaphysical thought? No, not at all. Yeah. Have you read Bertrand Russell? No, it's just, I'm just, I'm an atheist, because, right, isn't, isn't everybody? So often my, my Christian friends get really freaked out when they encounter atheists, and they say, oh, my friend is an atheist, and I don't know what to do, I don't know what to say, and, and, and you just think, well, there is such a thing as nominal atheism. Have you, have you ever pressed into what they actually believe? So often when people say to me, I, I'm an atheist, I say, oh, what are you praying for at the moment? <laughs> I, I swear, the other day someone said, actually, my mum's uh, going in for an operation, so I've really been, uh, really been thinking about her. But that, that, that was the sort of the, t the term that she was thinking about, right? And, and you do the studies. And, and people are becoming savvy about this. When they do the, the Pew Research polls or the Gallup polls, they've realized that just asking people, do you believe in God or not, is a not, not a particularly helpful answer. Because what they were discovering is that so, so many people who said, I don't believe in gods, later on in the survey, they were asked, well, do you believe in the supernatural? Yes. Do you believe in life after death? Yes. Do you believe in objective moral values? Yes. Do you believe in all this sort of stuff that is part and parcel of kind of Christian type faith? They believed all that stuff, but they were an atheist. Why? Because there's such a thing as nominal atheism, right? Just as there's such a thing as nominal Christianity. So when somebody says to me, I believe in gods, my next question is, which god do you believe in? Because there are lots to choose from out there in the marketplace. But if somebody says to me, I don't believe in gods, I've got the same question. Which god don't you believe in? And so often, you know, I'll say, which God don't you believe in? And, and my friend will say, oh, you know, just God. And I'll press them for details. I'll say, describe to me the God you don't believe in. And they'll end up describing some kind of distant individual, high on power, low on personality. 
You know, some kind of bearded figure with a thunderbolt ready to hurl. I say, that sounds like Zeus. <laughs> I don't believe in Zeus. Can I tell you about Jesus? Because I, I am obsessed with the Jesus God. I, I'm not generally some kind of theist, some kind of believer in God, and I just happen to have plonked myself with the Jesus brand. That's, that's, I've, my heart has been captured by Jesus and by the God who Jesus has revealed. That's why I use the phrase, the Jesus God. I, I picked it up from a, uh, an Iranian woman that I met uh, a few years ago. I was doing some talks in a university in Exeter, and uh, she came along and she sat in the front row. She was taking copious notes. And this was such an extraordinary thing in one of my talks that I had, I had to grab her after to say, what's going on? Why, you seem to be very spiritually alive, very spiritually hungry. And she said, well, I grew up in Iran and I grew up going to the mosque. I, I grew up learning all the prayers in Arabic. I don't speak Arabic, but that's what I, I learned. And I was a good, obedient Muslim. And then she said, my, my uncle got me a copy of the Gospels. And uh, he said, just on the quiet, have a read of this and see what you think. And so she started opening up Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, reading these biographies of Christ. And she said to me, I got halfway through Luke's gospel, and I realized that God could not be the God of the Ayatollahs, the God of the religious authorities. He could not be the God of the Ayatollahs. He must be the Jesus God. Whoever God is, he must be the Jesus God. Whatever other God might claim the mantle, they are unworthy of the name unless they have the, the towering personality and the stooping love of this Jesus. We must focus in on Jesus with a laser-sharp intensity. If someone believes in God, okay, what do you make of Jesus? Are we talking about the Jesus God here? If someone doesn't believe in God, well, which God don't you believe in? Have you rejected Zeus? Me too! Can I introduce you to this Jesus, this Jesus who in verse 24 says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you've given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. This is the God that Jesus shows us. Have you ever thought about that phrase, before the creation of the world? What do you think was going on before the creation of the world? I once asked a friend that. What do you think God was doing before he made the world? And he said, oh, that's a trick question. I said, it's not a trick question. There are, there are actually a dozen verses in the Bible about God's pre-creation life. What do you think God was doing? And, and he thought for a while, and he, and he said, I don't know, he was bored, I guess. And, and my friend, he just, he just had this thought in his head that God was just twiddling his celestial thumbs, kind of with nothing but his thoughts to keep him company, just itching to get on and create, just bored by himself. And that's, that's all he could think of. And, and then he said, well, Glenn, what do you think? What, what do you think God was doing before the creation of the world? I said, well, they were enjoying each other. He said, they? And then his, his face kind of fell and he, he kind of got it. He said, ah, you mean the Trinity. I said, yeah, which God were you thinking of? This guy was a Christian. He's actually gone on into Christian ministry full time. But which God was he thinking of? Which God were we thinking of? If you were to wind back the clock before there were planets or people or protons, what is there? What do you think was there? Jesus says, I was there. I know. I can tell you. It was great. It was a father always loving me in the joy of the Holy Spirit. That's really how you can summarize chapters 14 to 17, often called the upper room discourse. As Jesus, the night before he dies, you know what he really wants to communicate? His last will and testament. Before he goes to the cross, before he goes to glory, before he ascends to heaven, what does he want us to know? The Trinity. He really does. He wants us to know that there has always been a father loving his son, Jesus, in the joy of the Holy Spirit. What was there before the world began? A Niagara Falls of love and blessing and joy. That really comes out in these chapters. John 17, verse 13, for instance, Jesus says, I'm coming to you now, Father, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they, my people, they might have the full measure of my joy within them. It's just one of those things that Jesus has come to the world to communicate. He has always enjoyed the love of the Father, and now he comes into the world to share it with us. 
He's always been enjoying the glory of God, and now he comes to share it with us. He's always been enjoying this happy, blessed God. And now he wants to fill us with that same joy. He said something similar in John chapter 15, verse 11. He says to his disciples, I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. We believe in a happy God, a joyful God, a God who is a, a joyful union of Father, loving Son in the unity of the Spirit. And, and you might just think, well, this is just a, a New Testament thing, maybe. Maybe in the New Testament, God became triune and then for, therefore cheered up a little bit, but maybe, but maybe back in the Old Testament, maybe more fundamentally, God is a miserable monad. Is that what you think? Actually, no, no. The Old Testament is full of this same glorious truth. Let's have up on the screen Psalm 45. I love this psalm. Uh, a wedding song. Psalm 45, verse 1, my heart is stirred by a noble theme as I recite my verses for the king. My tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. You, whoever this person is, we will see he is a, a champion, he's the most excellent of men, and he's also called God. Verse 2, you are the most excellent of men, and your lips have been anointed with grace since God has blessed you forever. He's the eternally blessed one. Gird your sword on your side, you mighty one. Clothe yourself with splendor and majesty. In your majesty, ride forth victoriously in the cause of truth, humility, and justice. Let your right hand achieve awesome deeds. Let your sharp arrows pierce the hearts of the king's enemies. Let the nations fall beneath your feet. Your throne, O God. Oh, I thought he was the most excellent of men. Yes. He's also... God, your throne, O oh God, will last forever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you, that is, Messiahing you, Christing you, anointing you with the oil of joy. Here is this figure who is God, who is blessed forever by God, with God. Oil and the Spirit go together all throughout the Bible. So here, here we've got God filled by God with God. And what is this filling? What is this anointing? What is this joy? It's the Spirit of joy, the oil of joy. Here is God anointing God with God in joy. God is joy. God is joy. God is light, 1 John 1. God is love, 1 John 4. God is joy, Psalm 45. Or Proverbs 8. In Proverbs 8, you'll know that there's this, this figure, wisdom, who is older than the universe. He's the co-creator of heaven and earth. In Proverbs 8, verse 30, wisdom says this, Then I was constantly at his side, God's side. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence, rejoicing in his whole world, and delighting in the human race. Do you see this threefold joy? This co-creator of heaven and earth, the one who delights always in the Father, delights always in the world, and delights especially in mankind. What a threefold joy is on show here. Or I could go to loads of places in Isaiah, but in Isaiah chapter 42, here we have the Father speaking of his servant, Christ. Isaiah 42, here is my servant whom I, whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. My chosen one, my choice one in whom I delight. Delight. Back in Isaiah 11, verse 3, we, we had a, a kind of perspective from Christ. Christ said that he always delighted by the Spirit in the fear of the Lord. By the Spirit, he was always delighting in the fear of the Lord. And here, by the Spirit, the Father always delights in him. I will put my Spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. Who is God? He is a father always saying, behold my son, behold my son, behold my son. I delight in my son by the Spirit. I delight in my son by the Spirit. I delight in my son by the Spirit. Who is Christ? 
Christ is the one who is forever, according to Isaiah 11, saying, I delight in the Father by the Spirit. I delight in the Father by the Spirit. I delight in the Father by the Spirit. Who is God? God is joy. He is light. He is love. He is joy. And then he comes in the flesh. And in Luke chapter 10, verse 24, I love this. At, at that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father. I love that. Here comes Jesus in the flesh now. So he has taken on our flesh. He's become our brother. A member of the Trinity has become a member of the human race. And now by the Spirit, he is full of joy in praising his Father. Here is a window onto the life of God. A few verses later in Luke chapter 11, verse 1. Here we see Jesus before his Father. And here we have a window onto the triune life. Luke 11, verse 1. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. I, I love that idea. It's like the, the disciples are seeing Jesus. And Jesus is communing with his Father the way he has always communed with his Father. He has always said, my Father, my Father, my Father, my Father, in the joy of the Spirit. That's what Jesus has always been doing saying, my Father, my Father, my Father, in the joy of the Spirit. And always the Father has been saying, behold my Son, behold my Son, behold my Son, in the joy of the Spirit. And the disciples are watching Jesus do that, and they say, can we come in on this? This looks great. Did you know that's what prayer is? That's what prayer is. It's coming in on the perfect prayer of Christ. It's Christ your brother taking you by the hand into this Niagara Falls of love and glory and joy. And what does Jesus say when, when the disciples say, will you teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples? Jesus said to them, yeah, I'll teach you. When you pray, you say, Father. Isn't that great? Jesus, our brother. He's always been saying, my father, my father, my father, my father. And we say, can we come in on this? He says, yeah, sure. Now you call him father. That's when he teaches the Lord's Prayer in Luke chapter 11. Jesus has always been praying to my father. And then in the Lord's Prayer, he teaches us to call God our father. Coming in on that eternal Niagara Falls. Because here is, here is the gospel. Here is the gospel. God is an eternal fountain of light and life and love. And everything in this world has come from light and life and love. And we have turned from that light and life and love. But when you turn from light, where else do you go but darkness? And when you turn from life, where else do you go but death? And when you turn from love, where else do you go but disconnection? But that's the human condition. Here we are in this pit of darkness and death and disconnection. But then what does love do when love sees the beloved in trouble? Love says, your pit will be my pit. Your darkness will be my darkness. Your debts will be my debts. And so Jesus, the Son of the Father, stoops down, joins us in a pit of our own making. He takes that darkness on himself. He takes that disconnection from God on himself. He takes that death on himself on the cross, takes it down to the hell that it deserves. And then he rises up again on the third day and he says, you in the darkness, do you want my light? You in disconnection, do you want my love? You in death, do you want my life? And anyone who turns and says yes to Jesus, you come home. Jesus takes you by the hand. You belong now to him, and he belongs to you. And now Jesus says, you can call my father your father. You can be filled with my spirit so that he can be your spirit. You can have my future so that it will be your future. This is the gospel. You know, we were singing earlier, who makes an orphan a son or daughter, and I had to stop, I had to stop singing at that point. Who makes an orphan a son or daughter? You know, I'm, I'm only now and only just starting to see the tip of the iceberg of, 
of the cost of adopting. You know, we've been in the process for two and a half years and it hasn't been a, an easy process to adopt a son and bring him home. But my goodness, it's worth it. But it's what love does. Love, love reaches out to the orphan, reaches out to the disconnected and the dark and the, the deathly and pays whatever cost it takes to bring them home. And this is what Jesus has done for you. Jesus has done that for you to make you eternally happy. Is that good news? You know, that, that's why they call it good news, right? It's called good news for a reason. There's nothing better in this world. You can go out there, you can, you can ask every world philosophy, you can ask every world religion, do you have anything that approaches contemplating, even offering what Jesus offers? And they will all say, no, 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 no. No one else contemplates going near, even offering what Jesus gives you for free and forever. You think that's good news? Cheer up then. <laughs> right? It's good news. Good news, it is happy-making news. Spurgeon said this, his name is the happy God, and nothing gives him greater happiness than to give happiness to his creatures. His name is the happy God. Nothing gives him greater happiness than to give, his happiness, give happiness to his creatures. Well, Paul said it in 1 Timothy 1, he calls the gospel the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. The word blessed, you could translate that happy. It is. It's kind of a word for happy. This is the gospel of the glory of the happy God. You know, back in the 17th century, Blaise Pascal, you know, you might know him from his triangle. He's famous for his triangle, Pascal's triangle. Uh, but he was also a philosopher and a theologian, as well as a mathematician. And uh, he spoke about the dire state of the gospel going forward in France in the, in the 17th century. And uh, he wrote these words about why the gospel wasn't seeing greater fruit in his day. He wrote this, he said, men despise religion, they hate it, and are afraid that it might be true. Isn't that interesting that back in the 17th century, that's, that was the diagnosis of the problem. We think, Oh, back in the good old days, everybody just loved Jesus, and we've just fallen in this, in this like unbroken kind of descent from the glory days. And usually the glory days were sometime in the 1950s or something. But, you know, and, and it's all been downhill. Nonsense, utter nonsense. The tide of the gospel has gone in and out and in and out. There have been many worse periods, even in the West, for the gospel. Many, many worse periods than we're in right now. And even though the, the, the tide of the gospel is out at the moment, it will be back in. And you know that eternally it will be back in, don't you? You know that. We've been promised that. I have it on good authority that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. The tide will come back, right? We know that. But back in the 17th century, the tide was out in a way that made lots of people despair. Pascal said, men despise religion, they hate it and are afraid it might be true. To cure that, said Pascal, we have to begin by showing that religion is not contrary to reason, that it is worthy of veneration and should be given respect. Next, get this, it should be made lovable. We should make good people wish it were true. Then show them that it is. Do you see the heart of his concern there? He diagnoses the problem that people actually don't like God. That's the problem. Whatever objections your non-Christian friends raise, it's basically they don't like God very much. I did, a, I did an apologetic session in a high school in Eastbourne recently, and uh, they, they got me in, and I did five hours straight of answering thorny questions from teenagers. I got in there, I did 12-year-olds, then 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 16-year-olds, and for an hour each, they gave me their thorniest questions about sex and science and suffering and wasps. Lots of things about wasps for some reason. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big issue for teenagers in Eastbourne, wasps. And, and so I was doing my best to sort of answer these questions. And at the end, the, the chaplain just said something very wise. At the end, back in the staff room, he said, you know, people just don't like God very much, do they? And it's true. They just don't like God very much. 
And what does Pascal, what's the heart of the response that Pascal wants to make? He says, make it lovable, make people wish it were true, then show them that it is. You know how we do that? We enjoy God. Let us enjoy God. Let us not be those who are under the burden of the miserable monad. Let's be those who have been brought home by our brother Jesus, calling out Abba, Father, in the joy of the Spirit. And then let us flow out to the nations with an enjoyed God who is an enjoyable God. Because which God do you believe in? Which God don't you believe in? The God that so many of my friends have rejected is a distant tyrant or a pathetic energy. Let's reintroduce the world to Jesus. The Jesus who prayed, Father, I want those you've given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. The glory you've given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Here is a God the world can believe in. Here is a God the world can enjoy. Should we pray? Let's pray. Father, we don't know what we say when we say Father, but by your Spirit, would you cry out, Abba, Father, in our hearts? And then may we, by that same Spirit, cry ourselves, Abba, Father. May we know that this is our new spiritual heartbeat. May we enjoy adoption into your eternal life of joy and glory and love. Father, I pray that you would fill each of us with your Holy Spirit. Fill each of us with that same Spirit that energized the joy of Jesus, your Son. Would you fill us with the spirit of Christ, the spirit of adoption, the spirit of joy, that we might exude that joy out to the nations. Father, if there's people here tonight who have never really come home to know you as Father, they've only known you as some distant God or been suspicious of you, Father, by that same spirit, open eyes. Show them Jesus, and in his face may they see a welcome home. Fill us, Father, that we might flow to the nations. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.